Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the April meeting of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. And it's terrific to be here tonight with you. We have a, an interesting and enjoyable evening set up here. I have just a couple of announcements and talking a little bit about local astronomy. And then uh, without too much uh, astray, I'll turn it over to program chair, Victor Davis, who will inter introduce our guest speaker for the evening. And we'll go for perhaps an hour there and then we'll take a brief intermission. And I'll urge everybody to come back after the intermission where we talk about what's going on in the club and it's your chance to hear about what's happening in the observatory and elsewhere. And also to toss out ideas of your own and maybe ask questions if you're a newer member, anything is fair game. Well, it has been a challenging week cybernetically couple of weeks, I should say. And here I am referring to the strange disappearance of the AAAP website. And uh, we're all uh, recovered now, but it was a little touch and go because it mysteriously got hijacked. In the words of our webmaster, John Miller, the website was hijacked by a domain name server re-registration protocol that uh, we really had a difficult time getting to the bottom of. And some of you may have noticed for quite a few days there, uh, the website was down with a strange domain name server error thing coming up. Um, anyways, taken care of, I guess uh, bad news comes in couples at least. And I had a, a, a rude awakening Saturday morning in my home computing system, which was a, a fairly, um, I would say a fairly, uh, for me, <laughs> a very, <laughs> Um, high-end rig. It, it cost me quite a lot, but about an eight-year-old computer, I guess I can't complain, but my system went down, the motherboard died, and I'm scrambling now to build a new system and get my capabilities back up. So I'm coming to you from a laptop tonight. I don't have access to most of my files, but I have a couple of things in store I want to share with you nonetheless. So let's hope that's the end of the cybernetic challenges and that things will be smooth sailing. And a shout out to John Miller for really uh, saving our necks there. I know you spent quite a, a bit of time on the phone and online and trying to deal with the company's hijack. And, and we will, uh, you know, we can, we can talk about that after the break if people are curious. Um, here, I want to make a very positive announcement and to share with you the good word coming from Neil Ferrari, the administrator of Washington Crossing State Park, which is the location of our AAAP observatory. Uh, COVID restrictions have formally been lifted in all New Jersey state parks. So Neil urges that um, our members going out to the observatory do remain careful, obviously, especially with public, uh, but and to recognize that COVID cases continue to occur in central New Jersey. But I am absolutely delighted to say that we're back to near normal and we're going to do astronomy starting uh, next week. Uh, weekend. In fact, with the activities coming up, we have uh, public Friday nights beginning April 15th, this Friday. Um, I don't know if Dave stacked the deck, but my team drew first uh, session. So my on the duty roster, team five, which is me along with uh, Dave Zoller, Victor, uh, and also Scott Smith. And we uh, will be out there with the full moon. So thanks, Dave. <laughs> We'll come back to that moon party. There's a long story behind that, Rex. You know, it's it's a public a public pleaser. So we we do want to say that as we enter our Friday public nights, all members are welcome, not just the duty team that night. And we will be greeting the public, including campers in the park. And it should be a, an interesting spring because it's been a long time coming where we don't need to wear a mask out there. Um, just to mention a couple of events, we're, we're talking about local astronomy here. We have a meteor shower April 22. Sometimes the lyrics can be really good. Interestingly, this one might be good. It's kind of like a, they're, they're, they're predicting a medium rate, maybe 20 per hour. But um, if you get up uh, and, or stay up late before the moon rises, it will be a gibbous moon rising about 150. So that period between maybe midnight and 2 a.m. might be worth checking out. Um, okay, May 10th, we're going to have our regular meeting by Zoom. I hope our last Zoom meeting, knock on wood, uh, we're going to do the election of officers. And this is an annual rite of passage for AAAP. You, I hope, have seen the email messages from our, observer, our uh, nominations committee 
Joy Saxena and a couple of other members have taken upon themselves to try to poll the members as well as the board to find out do we have candidates for election at the main meeting. So please take a look at that email and give some deep consideration whether joining the AAAP board is something important to your future. This is how we run the club. This is how we reinvent the future of what astronomy means to us locally. And we do not want to take it for granted. We do want members stepping up to board positions. So have a look at the email from nominations at in astronomy and make a reply. And I'll be uh, collating that information along with the, the committee and we'll get that inside aerial times before the main meeting and we'll hold the election by Zoom at May 10. So we've been kicking around the ideas how to engage our members, you guys who have been patiently waiting for a chance to do astronomy again, not only the COVID restrictions, but also the lousy weather we've been having. So Dave and Jan and I and, and others thought it might be a cool idea to have a member's day dedicated out at the observatory. And we've chosen May 14. Now you're gonna look at calendar and say, darn, that's another full moon, which it is. But you know, the, the idea here is to have an opportunity to kind of meet and greet members. And many of us, especially those who have joined over the last few years have never had a chance perhaps to meet other members in the flesh. So here's our chance. We're gonna start around 5 p.m. I'm inviting all of you members to come out and join us, get a chance to see and talk about astronomy. And we're urging you to bring your own telescope. This is not a night to spend looking through the club's instruments as fine as they are, but rather to talk and to meet and to get to know each other a little bit and to answer your questions if you have any about how to set up, maybe you've come up with a new telescope over the last year or two. Here's a chance to talk to other members, the, uh, the key holders who may be out there, folks who know some of the hardware and software about how to. So please join us May 14 at the observatory about 5 p.m. And then finally, upcoming the next meeting uh, after May 4, uh, May 10th, meaning the very last meeting of our season, we're planning an in-person session at the planetarium, the, the, the New Jersey State Museum Planetarium in Trenton. And it's been a tradition of ours over the years to meet during the June meeting and we're reviving that tradition now. It'll be hosted by none other than Bill Murray, who is not only a member of, and board member of AAAP, but he is a staff uh, technologist at the planetarium. And he actually runs the show with the brand new a recently unveiled um, hardware and software set up at the planetarium. And there'll be more to be said about that at, at the May meeting. And Bill may want to give us a teaser then about what he has in store. Um, while we're talking about these kinds of events, um, I was just kind of putting this teaser up, but I'm really going to refer it over to you, Bill Murray, in just a minute to talk about the eclipse. Um, you may get asked when you're out at the observatory, what's with these, what's with the pink moon in April? What the, what's with the flower moon? What's with the strawberry? Where do these things come from? Well, you know, I don't want to dash and put cold water on public interest in astronomy. So we'll let those things stand. But the pink moon has no official standing in the world of astronomy. I think it's pink because dogwood flowers can be pink in the spring. It's also called the Pascal full moon. And it's kind of intriguing because Pascal is a word referring to Easter or Passover. And the full moon this year takes place the day before Easter, which is kind of cool and unusual. Well, speaking of local astronomy, this is just a reminder when you go out to the observatory and you go out at sunset and you tell folks to come out and join you. But remember, it's taking about 35 minutes this time of year to make it through each of the three phases of twilight. And those phases are based on the sun's angle below the horizon, six degrees per phase, before we reach a fully dark sky, dark quotation marks. Well, the sun is our local star. And this is an image shot from my handheld uh, super zoom camera one of those little um, Canon super zooms, which is a camera I love. It's not a telescope by any means, but this is our good fortune to be down on the Gulf Coast in Florida at the end of March. And this was a beautiful sight as the sun was setting. And it intrigued me to ask you guys this question. How far away is the horizon standing there 
usually thought of at six foot eye level. How far away is that sun as it sets? Not the sun. How far away is the edge of the ocean at the horizon? Nice. Now, those of you who were in the net celestial navigation course that Ira set up a few years back know the answer to this. So I'm asking you, don't speak first. Someone else tell me who did not attend the course, how far away is the horizon? 12 miles. 13. 12. 12. 7. 13. Gene came closest, and that's because he's a pilot, but he's usually up higher in the air. So <laughs> approximately 3.2 miles is the answer, is the correct answer. Oh, and it's all trigonometry, of course. So for your follow-up question, how far is the horizon for a migrating bird flying one mile up? Ah, think about that one for a minute. We're going to answer that after the break. Think about it. Flying one mile up, looking at the horizon, how far is that? Horizon. Well, when we were down on the Gulf Coast and having a fantastic time watching the sunset, I observed something else that's really quite curious that I wanted to share with you. This is quite amazing. And you've probably all seen it, but my camera seemed to capture it really well. Look at the shape of the sun as it descends down below the edge of the horizon. It's as if it's getting squished. What do they used to call that? An oblate spheroid? <laughs> Look at the shape yeah, of the sun as it's setting. This is not the camera lens. This is the atmospheric refraction as the wow. thickness of the atmosphere gets much greater as you get really close to that angle. It's so weird. It's so weird. No, no green flash? No green flash. I was waiting for it. I could have Photoshopped that one, but there was no green flash. Well, there's some other interesting astronomy to do at the local level, I wanted to call your attention to a couple of things in sidereal times. Uh, Prasad Ganti's article in the April sidereal times about the sun scientist, the passing of Dr. Eugene Parker, no relationship to me, alas, but he who is the namesake of the Parker Solar Probe. A great article written by Prasad. Check it out in Sidereal. Also, Lisa Fanning. Lisa, I don't know if you're on tonight, or Prasad either. I don't know if either of you are on. I can't see all the faces, but Lisa Fanning's been doing some great articles, and she used her iPhone 13 as the sensor with a Celestron 8 and got some fantastic images of the moon that are in the April edition of Sidereal Time. So shout out to you guys for doing that. Um, also, Tom, I know you had some interesting conjunction pictures you were working on, and I guess uh, that's Tom Swords I see there. I don't know who you shared those with, um, but I know there's another interesting conjunction event coming up around April 30. I would say it's a member event, but it's going to be when you get up from bed at 4 a.m. So in the eastern sky before sunrise, a really close Venus-Jupiter conjunction. So with that, Bill, you had some other thoughts um, about an eclipse of this entity coming up. Do you want to take over for a minute? I can stop uh, sharing slides, or do you need a slide? Uh, no, I can just talk over you. Um, All right. So uh, I have, was having a suggestion. Um, the, um, the date you've chosen for a, a club get-together on the 14th is fine. It's a Saturday. It's kind of unfortunate because the next night something very interesting is going on. We have a really nice total eclipse of the moon visible from here in New Jersey, starting at about 10.30 and ending about 1.30 or so. Uh, it's a very deep total eclipse. So it's gonna be uh, even better than the one last November, which was an early morning event. And uh, the one uh, bad thing about it is it, the moon is very far south. Uh, it's down in the constellation Scorpius or Sagittarius, which is about as far south as it gets. So, for instance, trying to do a, a video program from my observatory, uh, the moon's going to be in the trees, so I'm not going to be able to see it. Uh, but I was thinking we might want to uh, talk about having another member night the following night on Sunday evening and have everybody who has a telescope or a portable video system go out to the observatory because we have nice low Southern horizons there. We should be able to see the whole eclipse and, uh, and get together to view the eclipse through telescopes. If you have a telescope and want to bring it, that's fine. If you have a portable video system and want to bring it, that's fine. Uh, just a suggestion for something we might do as a club activity. <laughs> 
Terrific idea. I, I tell you what, why don't everybody think about this? And when we come back after the break, I mean, we are not wedded to the prior Saturday as the member day. It was a choice just based on let's pick a day. It's true that 1030 may be a bit late on a work night. So there's that. And it's going to be much later by the time it rises high enough to see. Right. So do you think so? Uh, no, I mean, it, it will have already risen. So it's, it is full moon. So by 1030, it should be a fair ways up when the eclipse starts. Okay. Well, let's think about it and come back to that. Excellent thought. Thank you, Bill, for that suggestion. So I think I'm going to stop here and it's time to get on to the main event. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Victor Davis, our program chair. And Victor, if you care to share your screen, I think I've released mine now and you can take it from here. Thank you, guys. All right. So I'm going to uh, abridge the uh, introduction just a little bit. Uh, but D Dr. Paul Daniels is going to speak on the mega constellation threat. Uh, the plummeting cost of launching small satellites has led to several companies having ambitions to place tens of thousands of them, potentially more than 100,000, into low Earth orbit over the next few decades. The growing threat is driven by economics and by the growing desire for low latency, high bandwidth global internet service. Dr. Daniels, a leader in the Royal Astronomical Society's Mega Constellation Working Group, Optical, will discuss the serious threats to professional and amateur astronomy posed by the projected astronomical growth of these reflective and emissive objects. A few words about our speaker. Uh, Dr. Daniels earned his PhD from Sheffield University, studying aspects of dust particle accretion and the structure and evolution of comets. At the Max Planck Research Institute, he developed prototype software for the satellite X-ray telescope ROSAT before moving on to a career in the computing industry and eventually worked for 30 years as a freelance IT contractor. Dr. Daniels joined the Guildford Astronomical Society in 2000 to renew his interest in astronomy and was the club's president between 2012 and 2018. He remains an active member. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and served on its council for several years, recently as vice president of astronomy. He currently serves on their international and education and outreach committees and chairs their IT working group. He's an active participant in the Royal Astronomical Society's Mega Constellation Working Group, Optical, and has contributed to conferences and workshops seeking to raise awareness of this growing threat. Dr. Daniels is currently the president of the UK's Federation of Astronomical Societies, a group of 200 member organizations representing 12,000 amateur astronomers in the United Kingdom. Um. The talk tonight, um, I apologize if I have the name of your society wrong, but I've, I've used the name I was given very early on and I realize that you have the, um, the letters the other way around. Um, I have provided a PDF copy of tonight's slides to, uh, to Victor, uh, if anybody would like a copy. And I think Victor said he'll put the um, slides up on your uh, YouTube uh, version of tonight's talk. Definitely. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what am I going to talk about? First of all, what is a mega constellation and how are they going to affect astronomy, professionals and amateurs and, and, and the different aspects of astronomy. It also has a bearing on the safe and sustainable use of space and our access to it. And I'm going to say a little bit about some of the, um, the treaties and legal aspects of mega constellations. <clears throat> And I believe that there is going to be uh, great potential for the raising of international tensions uh, over the use of, of low Earth orbit uh, because of the very large number of satellites uh, involved. So the first satellite was launched, Sputnik 1, 4th of October 1957. And since then, there have been um, nearly 12,500 satellites launched with just under 5,000 of those. Uh, still active as of, as of the start of this year. And 
One of the main uses of satellites is a communication satellites. And typically back in the old days, these satellites were launched out to a, a geosynchronous orbit. And I'll, I'll come to what that means in a minute, um, where they were used to broadcast to a single satellite could cover something like 40% of the Earth's surface. And so you would have a chain of three or four of these around the orbit and, and able therefore to bounce signals around the entire Earth. Big satellites requiring a lot of power because of their distance. And they were six to 8,000 kilograms, so that's six to eight tons roughly. And they would cost 100 to $400 million. This was the sort of cost that you would expect a large company or a, a nation to pay uh, to put into orbit. Partly also, of course, it was the early days of, uh, of, of spacefaring and uh, the technology was still new and bespoke and it was very expensive to get things launched. And this is not just the cost of the satellite, but of course, there's also the infrastructure afterwards for monitoring the satellite and so on and the control of the satellite. Things have changed now. Of course, electronics has become smaller and electronics requires a lot less power than it used to. So, um, and solar panels have become a lot more efficient. So now satellites can be made a lot smaller and, and it can cost as little as $25,000. That says $25, it's a bit cheap. $25,000 to, to launch a satellite. Um, and especially now that they're small enough to put um, many of them onto the same launch vehicle. So lots of satellites can now be launched more cheaply. And this is what's, um, risen really to the idea of constellations of satellites. These are a group of satellites working as a system of satellites. And if you have uh, more than um, a few hundred of them, there is no exact definition of where a constellation becomes a mega constellation, but more than a few hundred, you're probably into the mega constellation ballpark. So talking about different sorts of orbits, um, we have here the, 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 different uh, ranges of, of, of altitudes for different uh, satellites. The elliptical orbits, um, not many of those, um, the most common of them being what's called here a Molniya orbit. This one has a 12-hour orbital period where quite frequently this is used for um, surveillance satellites so that you arrange that your satellite is near uh, perigee, closest point to the Earth over should we say, a continent of interest. Um, and you get to observe it um, f f maybe in some detail, but you've got the satellite up here traveling more slowly out at the um, apogee point where it moves more slowly and you're able to see that, uh, that a, a continent of interest for a, a longer period of time, obviously in, in less detail. Um, we've got here the geostationary, geosynchronous Earth orbits. Both of them have in common the fact that their orbital period is the same as the rotation period of the Earth, so that the, uh, the satellite will maintain the same um, azimuth in the sky. If it's a geostationary Earth orbit, that means it's coplanar, the orbit's coplanar with the Earth's equator, so the satellite will stay in the same place. Usually these orbits are circular, uh, so it will stay in the same place, and that means that you can have uh, fixed satellite dishes pointing to that satellite all the time. Otherwise, you have to track the satellite. If the orbit is slightly elliptical or if it's inclined, then it may trace out a, a figure of eight as it goes up and below, up and down, above and below the equator. And figure of eight because sometimes it will lag behind the Earth's rotation and sometimes be in advance of it. So it will trace a figure of eight in the sky. Um, this is getting to be, there are quite a few satellites up, um, up, up in that sort of area, but the space there is, cr is crowded. And so it's been notionally divided into, into slots for the satellites there. Medium Earth orbit, again, not so useful because it's one of these neither one nor the other sort of range of altitudes, only 141 satellites there. But what's now becoming much, much more important is the low Earth orbit, anything less than a couple of thousand kilometers. Most of my altitudes uh, and distances will be given in, uh, in kilometers. Um, 
rather than, rather than miles. Apologies. Um, so I've sometimes seen it called near Earth orbit. I don't personally like the term near Earth orbit because a lot of objects that are in a heliocentric orbit that come close to the Earth uh, are also called near Earth orbit. So I prefer low Earth orbit to refer specifically to a geocentric orbit. Again, satellites here tend to be in a very circular orbit, uh, but they can have a range of uh, a range of inclinations. Now tonight in particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, Starlink satellites and they will have, as will many other operators, this what's called a Walker configuration. So this is a whole series of orbits, all with the same inclination, but they're staggered at the point where they cross upwards across the equator. And you may also have more than one satellite in any given orbit so that the satellites will be spaced out around the orbit so that you can actually have quite a lot of satellites. And the only thing you've got to do is to make sure that where those orbits cross over, that they are at slightly different altitudes by perhaps a kilometer or two so that there's uh, enough of a safety gap between them. So proposed mega constellations. So this is a, a chart I've tried to keep it up to date, but it is moving fast here. We have SpaceX as the forerunner here. They started really before anyone else. They've currently got permission from the FCC, license from the FCC to launch nearly 12,000 satellites. We have Amazon here. They've got uh, permission already to launch uh, about uh, three, just over 3,000 satellites. The Chinese here, and we have a total, if you look at just the, um, the ones in dark figures, the non grayed out ones, that's about 70,000 satellites that people have permission to launch. Now, when I mean permission to launch here, it means they've been allocated frequencies uh, by their particular national um, uh, authority for um, allocating frequencies. So in the US, it's the FCC. Um, in the UK, it's Ofcom. And all of those are acting on behalf of the ITU, which is the uh, United Nations central body that, that uh, keeps track of which frequencies are allocated. And so once a, a satellite um, a company or satel proposed satellite launch has been allocated frequencies and uh, has proven also, certainly in the FCC's case, proven that they have uh, plans to avoid collisions and explosions and uh, deorbiting uh, measures or an end of life measure at least, then this uh, th they, they will generally get permission to launch. Uh, my feeling is, and the feeling a lot of people is that this is not enough, is that uh, organizations, the, the departments like the FCC should also be uh, taking more note of the environmental effects of these launches and the end of life uh, situation. If you include the, the grey figures, these are proposed but not yet um, licensed, then there are even more satellites. And you can see here that there's another uh, 30,000 satellites here uh, that uh, SpaceX would like to launch and a similar number here for, for Amazon to what they've already got licensed for. Um, down here, the uh, Rwanda Space Agency, and I, I have to say I, I did smile when I saw this, the Rwanda Space Agency are proposing to launch 327,000 satellites. And I, my first thought was, uh, this is a joke. Uh, second thought maybe is that what they're trying to do is to grab a bunch of licenses and then to launch satellites on behalf of other people. Um, it appears that um, Greg Wiley, who is the, um, one of the founders of OneWeb, um, of the, the One, OneWeb satellites, he has, um, he has teamed up um, with some people to try and launch a, a lot of small satellites. Whether he will get a license to launch that many, I don't know. Smaller also means, of course, that they may be less bright in the sky, so maybe less of a problem. We'll have to see. Either way, um, you can see that there are plans over the next uh, decade or two to launch many, many tens of thousands, perhaps even up to 150 or 200,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. And this has 
consequences for astronomy, it also has consequences for the use of and access to space. Now, I'm going to talk more specifically about Starlink um, for the rest of this talk, but bear in mind that quite a lot of what I say will also apply to some of those other satellites. So the FCC have a requirement. Um, in fact, they modified their requirements slightly because you used to have a certain period of time from allocation of frequencies by which you had to have a satellite, at least one in orbit that was using those frequencies so that you didn't have um, a company squatting on the use of a particular frequency. Um, they modified that slightly with the, the constellations of satellites because they realized that launching a constellation was a process that took uh, maybe a few years and it was unreasonable to expect people to manage a whole constellation or mega constellation of satellites in the same time frame as getting one up to start using the frequencies. So this early <clears throat> phase one here, um, this is the initial uh, 4,400 of that initial uh, 12,000. Um, and I think by now, SpaceX have got most of these up in orbit. Um, they've got to have, uh, have half, at least half of them in orbit by uh, 29th of March, 2024, and rest of them by 29th of March, 2027. And I, th I think they're certainly going to meet that target. These here uh, have to be fully in orbit by uh, 2027. Uh, and I think uh, it's quite likely that they will meet that target as well. Down here, we have the other 30,000 or so satellites making nearly 42,000 in total. Um, and this hasn't yet been, uh, th these 30,000 haven't yet been approved uh, by the FCC. Now, I um, pulled out my spreadsheet and, uh, and got working with some of the maths based on the proposed orbits that would be used for Starlink's 42,000 satellites. Uh, what this shows here is the on on the on the side here on the on the ordinate it shows the number of satellites per hundred square degrees at the zenith. Now, just to give you an idea uh, of what a hundred squares degrees is, the square of Pegasus is an area of approximately two hundred and seven square degrees. Uh, the bowl of Ursa Major's Dipper has an area of about forty four square degrees. And if you add the quadrangles of Orion above and below the belt, uh, they total 82 square degrees. So that gives you an idea of what 100 square degrees looks like. And then down here we have latitude. So what this shows is that if you were to look up above your head, roughly how many satellites would there be above your head? This is not how many would you see, and I'll come to the reason for that later, but it's how many would there be above your head at a certain attitude at, at any given time. Now, here in the UK, and I, I happen to live at about 52 and a half degrees north, um, so you can see that there is a spike here that corresponds to a common orbital inclination for the Starlink satellites. And there are, you can see spikes based on other uh, common uh, orbital inclinations. And so you can see here that um, if the first two phases are launched, that means something like 0.6 of a satellite per 100 square degrees, which might not sound very much, but that's 1.2 in 200 square degrees, which means that the square of Pegasus at the zenith would always have <clears throat> at least one satellite going through it. And over a, the course of a photographic, ex photographic exposure, of course, that means probably several satellite trails going through it. Uh, I'll come back to this graph later on, but you can see that the inclinations of orbits go up to quite a, a, quite a high inclination. In fact, there are some in slightly, slightly retrograde orbit. But this incl the inclination of these orbits are designed so that, uh, in particular, the uh, North American continent and, and Europe, uh, the biggest market for these satellites, um, is, is covered. So what do the satellites look like? Well, first of all, they start off in launch here, um, flat packed inside uh, the payload bay of the, of the uh, launch vehicle, the Falcon 9. Uh, and here you can see that uh, one half of the fairing has been removed so that you can see, see what's inside. They're on rails. Uh, I think it's spring loaded so that the 
two halves of the shell come away in orbit and then the the catch is released and they they spring off in into orbit with a relatively low velocity and um, then they spread out around that orbit uh, they start out initially in in this open book configuration where the solar panel is parallel to the uh, parallel to the main body of the satellite and the idea of this is that the satellite is checked out in a low orbit of about 290 kilometers and um, they make sure it works uh, if there are problems and it doesn't work then the satellite is allowed to re-enter because 290 kilometers there's enough atmospheric drag to cause it to re-enter if the satellite is viable then it's moved uh, by thrusters and i'll come to the few more details later it's moved by thrusters to a to its operational orbit which might be typically 550 kilometers or perhaps 340 kilometers for some of the phase uh, phase two satellites um, these are quite low down and yes they, they are still being um, affected by the atmospheric drag the satellite moves into this what SpaceX calls the shark fin configuration uh, the satellite panel is oriented towards the sun of course and the underside of the satellite facing down to the ground they're planning to try and dynamically orient the satellite uh, during the course of its orbit so that it produces the um, an aspect from the ground that is least likely to cause reflections they've added um, these flaps underneath to try and shade the underside of the body of the satellite from the sun. The initial satellites that were launched were found to be um, bright, uh, depressingly bright. And um, so they tried to coat the underside with um, a proprietary matte black paint that uh, would mean that the underside wasn't shiny. The problem is that that affected the heat balance of the satellite. It would operate at a higher temperature and at a higher temperature, the satellite would fail earlier. So the next step was to use these sunshades underneath these visors. And they have caused a, a, a drop in brightness of uh, something like 0.8 of a magnitude, which is not seriously good, but it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's better than nothing at the moment. They're hoping that the reorientation of the satellites as it goes around its orbit will improve matters a little more. So that's the satellites, and in that there have been different versions of the satellite. The very early prototypes um, weren't entirely destroyed on re-entry. They, they are now. The uh, version of the satellites they finished launching recently um, were the ones where they trialed the dark satellites, the one with the black uh, paint underneath it, um, and they switched over to VisorSat. Uh, now all of the ones being launched are VisorSat. They've also increased the bandwidth per satellite, and they now have intra-satellite laser links, so that if you are uh, in the US observing, looking at a, a website in uh, Australia, then it means that your signal will go up to uh, the Starlink satellite passing over your head, bounce from satellite to satellite to satellite around the Earth, and then back down to the ground again. And um, it means that there's less require, less reliance rather on uh, ground stations uh, to pick up the, the signal and, and transmit it along the ground. Now, even though going around the Earth in space might seem slower, you have to remember that the speed of light in a vacuum is about uh, one and a half times faster than that in glass optic fiber. So in fact, the signal bouncing from satellite to satellite is faster than the signal traveling through an optic fiber on the ground. So not only is it uh, fast bandwidth, but it's also low latency. And that's very important for certain applications, both uh, financial and military. And of course, uh, the gamers who like to have, um, who, who like to be able to pull the trigger on their controller and not already be dead because they've been shot. Now, something in common to all of these is that they have Hall effect thrusters when using Krypton gas. Effectively, this is gas that's uh, squirted into a little chamber. It's heated by a spark and, uh, and heated and thrown out the back. Uh, 
and they use these very low thrust thrusters to raise the orbit from the initial assessment orbit, the injection orbit, raise them up to their to their final orbit, and to, to keep them in place. Uh, given that they're even at 550 kilometers, there is still uh, an atmosphere, a very thin atmosphere. You have to overcome the very small amount of drag that's there. Uh, you also may need to manoeuvre the satellite, and at the end of the life, you need to use some fuel to uh, slow the uh, satellite down so that it will uh, hasten its, its uh, re-entry. It's got these high-speed steerable array antennae underneath so that it can communicate with um, a whole set of ground stations, dishes on the ground. Uh, large solar panel to provide the power, and it uses a star tracker system to keep itself oriented properly. And it uses, it has access to um, a large database of satellites so that it, st st uh, SpaceX say, so that they can autonomously maneuver their way around other satellites. Having said that, in the early days of doing this, um, other people have had to move, the uh, European Space Agency had to move one of their satellites out of the way of uh, a Starlink satellite. Um, because at uh, that stage, uh, SpaceX hadn't sorted out the chain of communication um, from getting an alert that there was um, a risk of collision uh, through to actually make, moving the satellite to get out of the way. I think that has, has improved now. Um, okay, so you have here, this is the, one of the later uh, dishes uh, this is a square dish. The older dishes were uh, round. Um, SpaceX have applied for a license for, uh, I think, a million ground stations in the US. And the early beta was called the better than nothing beta. Expensive, though, $500 nearly and nearly $100 a month for the broadband. And um, the initial round dish was called Dishy McFlapface. And it had this very odd futuristic looking Wi-Fi router here. Um, in the early days, the problem was the coverage was patchy, partly because the number of satellites in orbit was still relatively low, and uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't have the laser links between the satellites then either. So it was, um, it wasn't wasn't brilliant, but it was better than some people had, and certainly um, if you had the money, you might be quite happy if you have a log cabin in the middle of nowhere where there are no. Um, cell masts, uh, you might find that this is the ideal solution. The problem is you have to have good sky visibility. Um, so it's no good if you're living in a log cabin surrounded by tall trees, because you won't be able to see down to the horizon. Um, and it's no good if you've got tree coverage above the satellite dish, and you also have problems with heavy rain and snow and things like that. So this is the this is the latest the later one. Um, they have a premium service too, uh, more expensive, uh, five hundred dollar deposit, two and a half thousand for the hardware, five hundred dollars a month. But they're saying that this may be higher speed with um, with better latency, um, and I would guess aimed at the business usage. The dishes are slightly steerable. You can see here a slot because that's because the the dish does move to track. Uh, the satellite but it also it does the tracking because as well as there being steerable beams from the antenna on the satellite the beams from this dish are steerable as well so that combined with the physical steering of the beam helps to track the satellite the earlier satellites the round ones would overheat and there were some problems uh, for some of those satellites where for people down in places like arizona where the temperatures get pretty high and uh, and there were instances of the dishes getting to a certain temperature and then just shutting off. Um, I don't know how successful these newer square dishes are. They've got a long waiting list for these. And uh, once you've got a lot more people using these satellites, of course, you've now got the satellite's bandwidth shared by a larger number of people. So it may be that some of the early users um, are finding their speeds very good, but they may actually fall a bit uh, as they get to be more and more people using the satellites. So you've got to do things like remove bird droppings and um, the early versions of the dish overheating, shutting down. And the dish had the advantage, the newer dishes certainly have the advantage of keeping snow off them because they, they, they actually allow the dish to warm up if there's snow on the top. 
so that it melts the snow off. But that does does have uh, dis disadvantages. Um, I, I would guess that uh, you don't get much of a signal when you've got the cats on here like this. Okay, so that's the background to the, the satellites up there uh, in space. Now, to get them launched, you have to say to you have to show that you've taken steps that they won't collide with each other because colliding satellites is not good news. If you take a one kilogram cube sat traveling at seven kilometers a second, it's got the equivalent of about six kilograms of TNT energy. So these are the typical estimates um, for the European Space Agency and NASA of how many um, objects there are of a given size. So there's a lot of stuff that is very small, um, tiny droplets of metal or flecks of paint and things like that. Uh, bigger than 10 centimeters might be um, an astronaut who's dropped a spanner or it might be um, a space fairing or maybe even an old booster, which of course is uh, much bigger than 10 centimeters. It's important, it's really important that we pay a lot of attention to getting stuff out of orbit and, cl and clearing up the clutter that has developed over the years. Um, it's, it's terrible to think that there are some rocket boosters from 20 years ago that are still in orbit around the Earth and they literally are space debris because they don't serve a useful purpose any longer. Uh, so we have to do something, and there are a lot of ongoing efforts to develop satellites that will deorbit this debris. It's very difficult to do, however, when you're talking about small one millimeter and one centimeter sized stuff. And if you have a one centimeter sized chunk of metal traveling at perhaps 10 or 15 kilometers per second, it's got a lot of energy. You're talking about a high velocity uh, rifle bullet or uh, shell and that that will do a lot of damage obviously if you had two one cube kilogram cubes that's colliding with each other in orbit uh, with the equivalent of six kilograms of tnt each there's not a lot left of either one afterwards and um, similarly you get a one centimeter lump of metal hit uh, hit a satellite or the international space station or something like that you you will have uh, serious damage now SpaceX claim that they can autonomously avoid each other. Um, we'll have to see how that pans out. If you think about the risk of collision, the risk of collision goes up roughly as the square of the number of satellites uh, in orbit. So if you have, um, say, four times as many satellites in five years' time in low Earth orbit as there are now, then you're perhaps getting 16 times the risk that you have now of a collision taking place. And bear in mind also at the moment, it's mostly just SpaceX who are at uh, 550 kilometers. Um, if others want to launch that altitude as well, different companies, different countries, including some that aren't as uh, friendly or cooperative, then you may find that um, it'll be very difficult to determine whose satellite should be moved out of the way. Um, and well, I can just see all sorts of potential problems. There needs to be some sort of space traffic control uh, to, to regulate how, how all this is done. Not only must they, must they not collide with each other, they also shouldn't explode. Batteries, electronic components, compressed gas components, they're all vulnerable. Batteries can wear out over time and may explode. So they have to be designed in a way that, that, uh, that they don't. And if they do, then uh, the parts are contained. Electronic components, some capacitors can, can explode. Um, and compressed gas components, you could imagine the gas cylinder that's used to drive the thruster and you get incoming uh, micrometeoroid hitting it and potentially causing it damage. So you have to make sure that you don't cause there to be more debris in orbit uh, than necessary. So SpaceX had to provide the FCC with those plans to deorbit. Um, and they will. Um, they they have said that if the satellite goes dead, it will take about five years. Excuse me, it will take about five years for the um, satellite to deorbit from a 550, 550 kilometer orbit um, from orbit down uh, down to reentry. That's if the satellite is completely dead and it won't respond to um, maneuvers or anything like that. Clearly, a normal end of life will use the remaining fuel to. 
slow the satellite down and bring it in faster. So if the satellite does become unresponsive, completely unresponsive, uh, then you've got five years of a slow, uncontrolled spiral in. So it now becomes a non-steerable satellite slowly working its way in. And that clearly adds to the uh, adds to the risk, especially with so many satellites being up there. Uh, that means that the even a small percentage of them going completely unresponsive will potentially present a problem as they slowly spiral in. Now, if you just think about 42,000 satellites with a typical five to seven year lifetime, that means deorbiting five to 700 per month and launching five to 700 per month to replace them. So you've got all the pollution from the launch vehicles and re-entry, rare earth metals used in the electronics being squandered because they're vaporized in the upper atmosphere. And if you are even conservative, orbit raising and deorbiting means that you've got something like 600 fairly bright satellites in the sky because they'll be brighter than when they're at their on mission orbit higher up. And um, also, during the time of launch, they have the satellite in its open book configuration to reduce the drag on the satellite. Um, and during re-entry on the way down, the end of life, they will have it flat on in the open book instead of edge on to maximize the drag and to um, hasten the re-entry. So during those times where the effort is on not having too much drag on launch and having the maximum amount of drag on re-entry, they will not necessarily be optimally aligned to reduce reflection down to the ground. So you're going to have something like 600 Starlink satellites, and this is just Starlink's 42,000, it's not counting any other operators, uh, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere each month, which amounts to 20 per day somewhere across the world, and they will leave bright streaks across the sky. And being low down will be uh, will be brighter so even though the aim is to try and make these satellites if possible below about seventh or eighth magnitude when they're in operation they're likely to be brighter um, just after launch and just before re-entry it's too early yet to see what the re-entry part of it is like but this is a problem that's rearing its head for later added to which um this vaporization of satellites in the upper atmosphere, one of the papers being presented at this uh, webinar um, in early May, is going to talk about um, the fact that you're altering the chemistry of the upper atmosphere in a way that we won't fully understand, particularly uh, aluminopsides, aluminopsides, oxides, um, and they, they will potentially have climate changing effects, but we don't know in, to what extent. Um, we have problems too. SpaceX had problems recently when there was a major um, solar event caused the Earth's atmosphere to warm and swell up slightly. Um, and this happened just after they'd launched satellites, mm -hmm. about 60 of them in one of the satellites, uh, one of the launches. And the effect of that was that it caused an increase in the drag on the satellites and um, the majority of them um, I think about 40 of them um, re-entered before they got a chance to get them up to a higher orbit. Uh, we're heading, of course, towards a solar maximum, and so we're going to see maybe more solar events, and we may see more satellites that don't quite make it to orbit. But I think also that SpaceX have looked at raising the initial injection orbit from 290 kilometers up to a slightly higher where the atmosphere is just that little bit thinner. So <clears throat> you've probably all heard of the Kessler syndrome and seen the film um, where a, a Russian satellite um, was destroyed and I'm trying to remember the film now, and the debris uh, catastrophically destroyed the uh, uh, space station. Um, fanciful in, in that sense, um, but it could happen. Um, I have some disagreements with uh, some of the um, people who study uh, space debris because they, they think more in terms of the long term. Um, 
problem is if you get debris collide with other debris, you end up with a chain reaction where the material that's in orbit grinds down to form more and more and more material, all traveling at high velocity. <clears throat> in low Earth orbit, of course, atmospheric drag will cause some of the smaller stuff to re-enter over a period of time. <clears throat> but if you're higher up, it, the higher up areas of low Earth orbit, so you're perhaps at 500 to 1,000 kilometers, um, you won't have as much material there, but it will take a lot longer to re-enter. And it only takes one or two close together collisions to cause a spike in debris that could make access to and the use of space much more dangerous. And I'm thinking back here to the recent uh, few months ago, um, anti-satellite test by the Russians, which spread a lot of debris around its orbit. And it, you could well imagine that other events like that could cause a more catastrophic problem. In fact, I, um, I have speculated um, that uh, potentially uh, the Russians were testing out the possibility of making low Earth orbit unusable because they can't compete. So maybe they'll do something to deny it to everybody else. <clears throat> um, don't rule that out, but uh, they just a personal thought. Okay, moving on to the radio frequency. How am I doing for time? Uh, well, I think we're doing all right so far. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, we have here the allocation of frequencies. So this is this shows you how close uh, one of the preserved bands used for radio astronomy is to the Starlink sound downlink. Um, they have agreed to leave a 250 megahertz uh, band gap between the two. I think, however, a particular problem with radio astronomy is that you've got a number of very significant molecular bands being observed. A molecular bands often spread across more than a narrow frequency. Very often, of course, you're also looking at things that um, are uh, redshifted. Therefore, the the frequency that you observe is redshifted out of the preserved band. Um, and you also have problems when you have these satellites um, because you, you have radio quiet zones on the ground around things like the square kilometer array where you have to turn your um, cell phones off and other equipment that could cause interference has to be turned off. And um, you have a problem with these because they're the radio equivalent of searchlights in space, beaming signals downwards. And there were some early worries that the strength of signal coming down would be enough to damage the receivers if they happened to pass through the beam of a radio telescope. It seems that some of the tests that have been done suggest that this isn't the case. Um, the other problem is that electronics, when it's working, produces radio noise and this noise is observable by ra by radio observers uh, from from the ground so even if the satellite stopped broadcasting actively broadcasting it would still be de faintly detectable because the radio receivers are so sensitive um, that if one of these satellites passes through the beam you're still going to get a small spike caused by just the electronic noise of the satellite. So having a lot more of them is not good for radio astronomy. And to my mind, um, there is almost more of a problem for the radio astronomers than there is for the optical astronomers. So a little bit about the geometry of visibility here. Um, now the upper diagram here shows a satellite at 1000 kilometers, 621 miles altitude. And we've got here everything to scale apart from the observatory. Um, that's not a scale observatory, of course. Um, most professional astronomers don't look at things below about 30 degrees above the horizon, unless it's a specialized study of some sort, um, too much uh, atmospheric thickness. And um, so if you've got the sun here 15 degrees below the horizon, then it turns out that at a thousand kilometers altitude, all of this orbit in that cone of interest is illuminated by sunlight. And you've got a particular problem over here because this part of the orbit is closely parallel to 
the this um, direction of sunlight. So you're going to get glinting off the um, off the surface of the solar panels on the underside. That's difficult to deal with. When the sun goes further down below the horizon, so you've got here the sun 30 degrees below the horizon, everything else the same. And you can see now only part of that cone above the observatory is illuminated. Here, satellites in this part of the orbit will be in shadow. Not entirely true if you're observing in the infrared, because it may be that a satellite that has moved from being illuminated into the shadow may still have a certain amount of thermal inertia and be glowing slightly uh, in the infrared in this part. So, but for optical, these satellites would be visible and these wouldn't, unless you're talking about transits. But again, most the chance of a, of a satellite transiting, for example, a star is pretty small. You get less of a glinting problem, but it's still possible to get some glinting. So this, this issue of how far the sun is below the horizon is important because that then introduces uh, a seasonal effect. Now, here you can see a, uh, a typical case of, um, I'm sorry if I'm, the phrase we use is teaching granny to suck eggs here, but this is where we have um, the, 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 you can do the maths uh, for a 23.4 degree uh, inclination of the Earth's axis and show that the celestial equator here is 40.97 uh, degrees below the northern horizon if you're at a latitude of 40.3 degrees north, which I believe is roughly the latitude of Princeton. So that means that here the Tropic of uh, Capricorn here is 26.3 degrees below the northern horizon in the summertime. Therefore, the, this, is, this is the sun is only this far below the northern horizon. And in the uh, early part of the evening and if just before uh, dawn, uh, the sun clearly will be will be less than 26.3 degrees below the horizon. In the winter time, it goes down to 73.1 degrees below the horizon. So in the winter, the satellites, uh, the sorry, the um, the sun is below the horizon and much further below the horizon for for much longer. Um, the the slides I've got here allow me to actually play with the. I had fun one day coding this in PowerPoint v, Visual Basic. <laughs> Okay, so we have uh, possibly then generating a graph like this, where we're saying how, if you look at the satellites and think of them as being roughly evenly distributed um, in the sky above you, then what percentage of them above you will be uh, illuminated? And this, this shows the, the importance of trying to keep your satellite orbits low. So for example, with a 290 kilometer altitude orbit, then by the time the sun gets to be 21 degrees below the horizon, you've pretty much got all of your satellites in the shadow and you won't see them. Um, if you're going to higher altitude orbits, so here, for example, say the 1,110 kilometer orbit, by the time the, the low ones have disappeared, um, you can still see most of the ones in the higher altitude orbit. This was one of the reasons why SpaceX decided to move some of their satellites to lower orbit. One is that they will be less visible. And the other one is if something goes wrong there, uh, they will, they will re-enter by themselves in a shorter period of time. So the time of year plays an important factor here. So in the winter time, when the sun is below the horizon for longer, the satellites will be illuminated for much less time. If you like the shadow projected up into the sky, Earth's shadow uh, will cover more of the sky and therefore the satellites won't be illuminated for as long. In the summertime, you may well find at certain attitudes that satellites will be visible because there's little to no shadow at all. So that's the, the one factor is the geometry. Um, and the other factor here is the, um, the actual satellites themselves. So um, they've been estimated at, at between 4.2 to 5.9 magnitude at 550 kilometers. Um, some of the later ones are a little bit fainter than that with that now with the visor sat, but during orbit raising, they've been seen between first and third magnitude. 
So this isn't great. Um, the visor set has improved things, but um, it's not uh, it's not there yet, really. And particularly for certain types of telescope, it's nowhere near there, and it's going to cause a problem. Um, I won't I won't go through this in detail. Uh, just to say that it's um, it's designed to say if you've got satellites at a particular altitude, uh, how big will they be? Uh, how fast will they be traveling across the sky um, at a given angle above the horizon? And if you use this table and use this equation and this figure here for the density of satellites, you can get back to that spiky graph I had earlier. You can get an idea of how many satellites you're likely to see pass through your field of view in a given period of time. It turns out that the wide camera format telescopes are the ones that are most affected, the, the wide field of view. If you are looking through binoculars, for example, with an eight degree field of view, uh, a square degree field of view, then you, you will, over, um, over a 10 minute period, you will probably see uh, six satellites pass through that field of view. A typical amateur telescope with, say, a one degree field of view, uh, you might see three quarters of a satellite per 10 minutes. Um, obviously, that you scale that up for longer observation. Um, but that does mean that you're, for a long exposure, astrophotographers may well see that they would have uh, more than one or two streaks perhaps going through the field of view. The Vera Rubin telescope, which hasn't even seen first light yet, um, it's already predicted that by the time it, uh, it's, it starts to operate, something like 40% of its images will have streaks passing through that will render the images it takes either unusable or of less use um, than they should have been. Um, I've got a, a simulation here. I won't show you the simulation because it will take time to go through it. And I'm conscious that I normally take an hour and a half to give this talk, uh, but you can go to this here and um, I, I I won't, won't show it, as I say, but it, it, it allows you just to play around with um, what 42,000 satellites look like when they go around the Earth. And, and for fun, you can have a look at my lunar simulator as well. It just simulates the phases of the moons. This is me playing around with the graphics and showing off of it. OK, so who's affected? Professional astronomers, fast transients um, affected by um, the satellites passing through the field of view, high Z supernovae, particularly the wide field surveys. Um, spectroscopy. Now, I mean, if you've got an image with a satellite streak passing through it, it may be that there, were, there are ways of processing that streak out. If you're doing spectroscopy, of course, you can't do that because the spectrum of your satellite, mostly solar radiation spectrum, um, is intermixed with the spectrum of your object of interest, and therefore you can't remove it from the spectrum. And you oh may my. not even know. Sorry? Are you... Sorry, did someone say something? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, it, may, it may be that you, you, you do not even know that a satellite has passed through the field of view and corrupted your spectrum. Um, and there's also the problem, particularly um, for... Uh, the telescopes that are used for looking for near-Earth asteroids and comets, um, it may be harder to, to spot them when you've got all of these other uh, moving objects in the sky. So this is a particular instance of um, what a, a track on the simulated track would look like for the, for the Vera Rubin telescope. Um, this is because you've, they, they use uh, CCD sensors and you get a lot of interference between uh, the cells in the CCD. And you get the initial bright streak here, and it's saturated the, the sensor, saturated the pixels completely. It's a bit like connecting a, a, a very high voltage battery when you've got your meter set to too low a value, and the needle just swings over hard to the right and reads the, reads the maximum it can. You don't know what the voltage is because the needle's hard over to the right. In the same way here, you've lost any information that might be underneath that streak 
because you've saturated the pixels. And because you've saturated, you get an overflow of the current inside the sensor. And these parallel streaks here are ghosts caused by the saturation in this main streak. It's also the possibility that you take a picture and if you come to take another picture shortly afterwards, you don't completely clear down the sensor when you, when you, the, the device, when you come to take your next picture. And it may even be that there are some ghosts of, the, of this saturated streak left in the subsequent picture. So it's a real problem for CCDs because they are so sensitive and because of the way they work, the internal electronics of them means that you get these, these problems. There has been some talk of redesigning the sensors to use uh, CMOS instead, which is less prone to this. And if you use um, a digital SLR camera to do astrophotography, they mostly tend to use uh, CMOS sensors. So the problem is processing. If you're, if you're going to process these out, ideally you want streaks where you can analyze the profile of the streak and subtract it from um, the picture. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Okay, false alarm. Um, and you subtract it from the image, in which case you may be able to re re reveal the details underneath. The problem is that some satellites uh, tumble and therefore the streak isn't a constant width all the way across. Uh, it may be that you've got a little bit of cloud or you've got trees or something like that. And so you've now got a streak that's interrupted or doesn't have the same density all the way along its path. So it's not an easy problem to solve, but it is potentially doable if they can make the satellites faint enough not to cause saturation. It's not um, all uh, light for satellites that are placed in orbit to do observation. Um, this is um, a to scale cross section of um, satellites here in 540, 50, 65, 70 kilometers. So here's a blow up uh, that shows the satellites in these spaced orbits. The Hubble Space Telescope orbits roughly between the limits of these black dotted lines here. Now, if you can imagine uh, being at the bottom end of this, uh, this shell of satellites looking outwards, there is a fairly high chance that some satellites will pass through your field of view. They will be slightly out of focus, some of the more distant ones. Uh, the, the closer ones may be significantly out of focus, but of course that does affect the HST's image. Already, they are seeing something like 2.5% of HST images being spoiled. And uh, by the time we get up to 60,000 satellites, uh, it was estimated that there could be 20% of the HST's images being spoiled because of um, low Earth orbit satellites passing through its field of view. There are others, CHEOPS is an ESA satellite, uh, and also NASA's WISE satellite there, similarly uh, making observations where either they are in low Earth orbit themselves, or they're making observations that uh, pass quite close to the limb of the Earth, and therefore will be looking through the shell of satellite orbits that uh, surround uh, the Earth. Uh, I've already covered this, um, yes. So amateurs, um, generally a smaller field of view, so less of a problem because smaller field of view means you're less likely to get a satellite pass through. Um, if you're doing photography with a long exposure, you're more likely to be affected. The CMOS cameras are less likely to be affected, and so it may be possible to use software to remove the trails. And software is being developed, and this software will be freely available to try and identify where the streaks are and remove them. So that's one possibility. The other one is to simply avoid taking pictures when the satellite's going to pass through your field of view. This does require that you know exactly where the satellites are. And the ephemeris for the satellite has got to be good to, to know that. And at the moment, there, there was an estimate that the ephemeris goes out of, uh, out of date within about eight hours. So it needs constant observation and tracking of all these satellites to keep their ephemeris up to date sufficiently accurately to have either the ability to stop and start your observation 
at a time when you know the satellite isn't going to uh, cut across your picture of the Orion Nebula, um, or else maybe you can develop a computerized shutter that will shut as a satellite passes through the field of view and, uh, and open again afterwards. And it's, it's no good doing that if you don't know where the satellite's going to be there. So they've got to be accurate ephemerides. And of course, for the radio astronomers, um, there, the other solution was that um, SpaceX are talking about steering beams away from the radio observatories, but that doesn't really help the amateurs very well um, because um, they, they're not going to steer beams away from uh, an amateur astronomer sitting in his, uh, in his garden, uh, especially if you're close to a, a built up area. For the public, it's still something of a curiosity and a spectacle. And I got quite annoyed by some of the um, tabloid newspapers that uh, seem to look at the launch of Starlinks as a fireworks show. Did someone speak? No? Um, and I think gradually people are becoming aware of it. And my, my inclination is, or my feeling is that the newspapers tend to be more interested in the uh, space access and space debris uh, side of the problem. And also most of the satellites will be below naked eye magnitude once they're in orbit. Um, but that's no good for astronomers, of course, who use telescopes and can see well below that. They'll still be visible as they uh, rise to orbit and re-enter. And um, one of my worries is that it could uh, could damage the the uptake in astronomy for young people that the wow factor may may be damaged a bit and um, that that may affect us in the future getting people into science uh, into the stem subjects um, i'll skip over the stuff about satcom because uh, i don't have time to that okay but there are two sides to the story uh, clearly there is a big push. A lot of people want to have um, fast global internet. Um, and this is certainly one way of, of doing it. Um, what treaties are there, however? What agreements are there between nations? And really the one that's the sort of the granddaddy of them all is the Outer Space Treaty, originally formulated in 1967 and extended later. 63 signatories, including the US, the UK and Russia, and basically ag agreeing to play nice in state space and not to put weapons of mass destruction into space. And uh, if um, you have um, a, a satellite, a space station or a spacecraft that's in distress, then um, you would expect another nation maybe to offer their help to send someone to go and help you out and this sort of thing. And it stood the test of time for quite, quite a while. There was an attempt by some nations on the equator to try and uh, reserve slots in the geosynchronous orbit that were over their territory, over their longitudes. Um, and uh, seven countries and uh, the declaration was ignored by everyone else because by this time, um, people were getting used to the idea that space was going to be useful. Don't forget 1967 is only 10 years after Sputnik 1. By 1976, you're now another um, nine years further on. And uh, by the time you start to get around to later treaties, then people have realized that space is going to be really, really useful. And, and you don't want to give away, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot by signing up to treaties that may restrict what you can do. So the Moon Treaty in 1979 um, fell foul of that rather. The United Nations tried to say that all celestial orbits and bodies fell under the jurisdiction of the United Nations. Um, there were no major signatories, none of the spacefaring nations signed up to it. And so again, it's been widely ignored. And then you had Obama sign um, a treaty, an act in uh, 2015 in the US, saying that uh, although no one could own a celestial body, uh, even if it was an asteroid that you had captured and towed into Earth orbit. You didn't own the asteroid. Um, but anything that you took off the asteroid, you could keep. Um, and then Trump signed an executive order where he had the phrase, outer space is a legally and physically unique domain of human activity, and the United States does not view it as a global commons. 
it's a legal term, global commons, meaning something that's shared by everyone, owned by nobody, dominated uh, to the exclusion of everyone's use. And um, one of the concerns, of course, is when you have these mega constellations uh, in very close altitudes of orbits, um, you're sort of excluding other people from using it by, by virtue of the density of satellites you're placing there. And this is a big complaint by other nations already and other companies already that SpaceX are rather hogging their share of space. Um, the other problem here that we have is that I've already alluded to the potential environmental problems that could be caused by these satellites, the launch and the re-entries and the potential effect on climate that we as yet unquantified. Um, and the thing is, the FCC isn't bound to observe the National Environmental Protection Act that many other uh, agencies in the US are. Um, and I think that may well change in the future. And it may be that, in fact, that's already caused a delay in the licensing of the other 30,000 satellites that SpaceX would like to launch. And at the moment, of course, they're having um, issues with the FAA um, over their continued use of the launch site at Boca Chica because they've built it in um, effectively in a wildlife park or next to a wildlife park. And, um, and people are complaining about the damage it's doing to the environment there. Um, the other legal argument here is that um, the CEQ, Council on Environmental Quality, have said that every agency is required to continually update its policies. And the advent of mega constellations is a significant change in the use of space and the frequency of launches and the, the density of satellites in space. And the FCC should have updated its policies. It hasn't done it in nearly 30 years. And so it's effectively broken the law by not updating its policies. I can't see the FCC being forced to rescind its license. Uh, but it may well mean that, um, that the other 30,000 satellites never get to be launched and that there are more stringent constraints than other operators. SpaceX are getting military contracts, strong military contracts, and of course also the, the, the war in Ukraine uh, with um, uh, the provision of uh, Starlink satellite terminals to, to the Ukrainians. Um, is showing their value in a conflict. And I know that the um, US military are looking to um, integrate the use of Starlink into their advanced battle management system. And um, we now have, of course, uh, a fourth force, the US Space Force. And uh, we have a Space Force in the UK and some other countries do as well now. And effectively, this is putting in place military capability to protect space assets. And um, my worry is what I see here is in parallel with the growing commercial use of low Earth orbit, a growing willingness by the military to effectively try to um, dominate and to control and use and protect their assets in space. And already I've seen talk about putting weapons into space, even if they're not weapons of mass destruction, the possibility of using space as a place to store weapons that will re-enter on command. And again, because of time, I won't show this Vision for 2020 document. Um, I'll, I'll include it with, I'll, I'll send it to uh, the document to, to Victor, but it's an interesting document uh, that uh, was written uh, some years ago that shows... Um, the forward-looking plans of the uh, US, um, US, uh, US military for the vision for 2020. And it looks a little bit more like a, a pamphlet from Ming the Merciless than, um, than a, a serious document. But just reading the language, it talks about the dominance of space. And, and whilst, as, as American citizens, you may be quite comfortable with that, it does worry other people around the world um, that um, you may see low Earth orbit uh, dominated by, by one country, one country on one company, maybe in that country, um, 
potentially excluding others from making proper commercial use. There is a sort of um, Oklahoma land rush feel to this. I'm going to get there first, get my foot in the door and exclude others. And it may, may well cause tensions later. Space is increasingly being seen as a valuable commercial resource. So uh, my final slide. Um, these attempts to dominate space, and you can well understand why. Commercially, it's, um, it's a very powerful thing to do, and militarily, it's very valuable. We don't have international treaties, and they're unlikely. New treaties are unlikely to be signed for the same reason that the Moon Treaty didn't work. Nobody's going to sign up to it because they're going to be shooting themselves in the foot um, in the things they want to get out of the use of space. Um, what happens, for example, if um, Russia, particularly in these uh, trying times, what if Russia decided that they don't want Starlink satellites flying over their space? After all, you get Russia and China and others who have gone to the extent of um, trying to isolate their citizens from the external global internet, and they put firewalls there. But if you can observe unfiltered internet from space, then that may not be what some of these regimes want. So what if they decide to take pot shots at these satellites and take them down? And this could apply to the US and could apply to other countries, but a nation probably has some control, some sway on the people who operate these satellites. What if, for example, uh, the United States decided that uh, in a disagreement with Iran, that they said, you will turn off Starlink satellites whenever they pass over to Iran. So effectively, you can impose a digital sanction on a country by effectively requiring an operator to, um, to, to blacklist the use of the satellites over a certain country. So that there are all sorts of political and, and international issues here. And I certainly can see uh, in the things that are happening in the articles I read, I can certainly see tensions building up. So it's a problem, not only for um, the astronomers, amateurs and professionals, not only for space in terms of the, the, data, the, the debris in space, uh, but also getting up into space. Suppose you wanted to launch something like uh, the James Webb Space Telescope in, uh, in, in 10 or 15 years time. Um, I can tell you the insurance is going to be so much higher by then because of the risk of, of collisions. Um, and it's also a problem because of, uh, because of the, the, the tensions that may be raised by the clamor to use low Earth orbit. And this, this is why I titled my talk, The Mega Constellation Threat. Thanks very much. All right, well, thank you. Do we have any questions? I think we have a uh, time for a few. Don't forget to unmute yourself before you um, ask your question. And if you can type it into the chat, we'll try and monitor it from there also. Let me toss in a quick question, uh, Paul. That was a, an elegant and fantastic, albeit very depressing and worrisome talk, but you've really taken us a long way to understand the nature of the problem. Are you hearing any talk of a moratorium from the FCC? Because it strikes me that's what we need until this thing can be dealt with at a much deeper level, a moratorium against new launches. Is there any talk of that? Um, I think a number of astronomers, of course, have, have called for it. Um, I don't see, I haven't heard any news from the FCC or rumors um, that they're planning that sort of thing. I think the difficulty, of course, is that once they've given a license to SpaceX to launch their satellites, um, imposing a moratorium imposes a financial cost to SpaceX. SpaceX will be setting up their infrastructure to make the launches. Um, they launch 60 at a time on the Falcon 9s. On their uh, Starship, they're going to be able to launch 400 at a time. Um, so SpaceX, if they if that moratorium were imposed, I think SpaceX would have um, a fairly hefty financial claim to make against the FCC for effectively suspending their license to launch further satellites. Um, 
also from the point of view of you've got to think who the the lobbyists would be and the military contingent i'm sure would have a very um, strong point to make since they already have good plans to what they want to do i mean even just for things like um warfare in the polar regions um you've got no cell towers up there even military communications are not very good there but if you've got starlinks in in near polar orbits then you've got communication and um so again the military they've been doing things like um looking at the use of starlink satellites to control and guide um cruise missiles things like um just things like guiding a fighter in for refueling from a, a flying fuel tanker. Um, th these sorts of things are sort of starting to embed into the military thinking, not just the Air Force, but, but um, others as well. So I, I think that given how powerful the military lobby is, I think it would be very difficult to put the brakes on this. Uh, uh, Dr. Indelgis, I wanted to ask you, I mean, it, it sounds as though, I mean, if there's a contest of wills, obviously, between the military and, uh, you know, the, the guys, the Call of Duty players and amateur astronomers, uh, we're losing big time. But what about the more crass commercialization of space? Like, you know, one hears about putting Pepsi logos in near Earth orbit and that kind of stuff. Is there anything that we can do, um, you know, to try to alleviate some of these threats? I, I've heard of more success against that kind of, um, of use of, of space. Um, I mean, the other thing, too, is that they would have to be very big if they were going to be visible with the naked eye from the ground. Um, and the only ones I've heard about have been relatively small and therefore would require a telescope to see. Um, I'm not quite sure of the of the usefulness. One that's of growing concern is the possibility of power from space, mm -hmm. putting up very large uh, mirrors, um, potentially a couple of kilometers across, that would focus light onto um, a microwave generator that would beam microwaves back to the Earth. Um, more than I think NASA have got sort of ideas for this and certainly the European Space Agency have been working on it as well. Um, and of course, an object that's a couple of kilometers across is going to be a serious problem. It's more like a, a mini moon than a satellite. Uh, so I, I think there are other, other, other threats up there to worry about more than um, the occasional relatively small advertising logo. Oh, doctor, I see this as a possible uh, bright, uh, bright spot that it could prevent governments from oppressing speech and that type of thing. I know in this country there's a lot of oppressing of speech in uh, Facebook and Twitter and Google. Um, so, you know, that is a bright spot that uh, can come through, plus also the totalitarian regimes if we have more of those satellites. I mean, mm. you know, that, that's... You know, what I see is an upside. It's just a comment, really, not a question. But yes, okay. well, I mean the the um, and again, the Ukrainian conflict is is showing that they're useful there. Um, the difficulty, I suppose, is that people in Russia, for example, or Iran or China, are unlikely. They might be able to import them, um, but they probably wouldn't. They'd probably be in a lot of hot water if, if they were discovered with one of these on their roof um, because they clearly would be designed to circumvent um, national restrictions. Um, the dishes that were um, donated, I've seen the phrase that uh, SpaceX donated them to the Ukrainians. In fact, I, I believe most of the dishes are actually paid for out of US taxpayers' money rather than... Um, rather than entirely by SpaceX. Well, I mean, you seem to be seeing this less as an opportunity for, let's say, democratization and more as, a, as a, uh, an opportunity for uh, strife. 
I mean, certainly, I, I, I can certainly see the benefit. I mean, the same way that uh, social media have, have been used um, in some countries to, to s- spread information in a, in a way that their governments don't really approve of, especially with things like um, people using VPN to get to get around their no- national firewalls and so on. Um, certainly, the, the the use of the internet is is a great thing, and and we can already see that many of the protests that have been taking place in Russia have come about because young people have access to the internet and they perhaps um, view it um, more than than older people in Russia. So yes, you're quite right that there is there there is a great advantage to it. Overall, I I also see more problems. The prob- problems that are going to be there because of the the contention for the space for the volume there's only so close that you can pack satellites together before you get collisions and and my worry is of course that you're going to then start running into um into suing and counter suing you know was your satellite to blame or was his satellite was to blame and and so on the lawyers are going to have a field day with this if satellites start to collide with each other i don't know that um because under the Outer Space Treaty, this was the one that was formed in 1967, um, if uh, one nation is responsible for causing a collision, then they have to pay reparation to the satellite that they collided with. But mm-hmm. um, then it becomes difficult if both satellites are manoeuvrable, which one's to blame? Uh, if one's manoeuvrable and another's not, then maybe there's uh, more of a case for saying that the one that's to manoeuvre is for blame. But what if the one that can maneuver is the one that was there first, um, been in orbit longer? Uh, there are all sorts of things that need to be sorted out from a legal point of view. I know we're, we're occur. running late here, and we don't want to keep you. You must be really uh, quite exhausted being as late as it is <laughs> in the UK. So thank you for persisting this long and for giving us your energy and your outlook. Let me just ask one quick question that might be of some value to us. You know, we Americans have not lost faith in Congress, despite what the media may have others believe. Um, do you think that we, do you think taking this to our congressmen is a useful thing to get this to get more congressional oversight as well as oversight of the agency? I think it may help. I think certainly think that there needs to be more oversight from the environmental point of view. Um, these if you're, if you're launching satellites um, on such a regular basis just to replace them, then the, there is atmospheric pollution from the launches, uh, as well, of course, as, as the material that's being wasted by re-entry and, and affecting the upper atmosphere. So I, I think there is a terrestrial environmental effect, and the FCC mostly has said, well, we don't worry about the environmental effect because it's all going up there in space. Well, you've got to get up there and get back and, and do something with the satellites afterwards. I mean, one of the early solutions was to put satellites, dead satellites into a uh, sort of end of life satellites into a graveyard orbit. But of course, that's almost as bad because once your graveyard orbit starts to get full, they start to collide with each other. Um, so, yes, I, I, I think it's always good to talk to the politicians and make them aware of the problem so that... Um, um, money isn't the only objective when they they look at uh, legislating on these things all right well, well thanks so much again and i'll make sure that <clears throat> anything you send me gets shared among the members of the club so uh, get some sleep thank you very much for talking <laughs> to us thank you so I've, much I've Paul. A... that was fantastic thank you pleasure. and let's keep some hope here it's difficult i know pleasure <laughs>